Welcome, Adam's followers. You are positively glowing today. This week's sermon is my first look into the explosives of the Fallout series. We won't get to them all in this video, but we will be looking at the conventional, the weird, and the mundane hand-thrown explosives in the Fallout series. So crank up the rads as we pull the pin on the explosives of Fallout. Let's kick this list off with what has become commonly associated with resistance and rebellion everywhere, the Molotov Cocktail. The name first came from that silly little place, Finland, who named it after a real-world Soviet foreign minister, named Vyacheslav Molotov during the Winter War of 1939. The Molotov can be found in nearly every Fallout game, the first three Fallouts, skipping three, and then being found again in Fallout 4 and 76. The in-game representation in Fallout and Fallout 2 isn't anything crazy, but I do find it interesting that although it is inferior to the frag grenade, it is still way less common. Since they're so much easier to create than a legitimate frag grenade, one would think that they would be more common. Since all you need is some fabric, a glass container, and flammable liquid, the only place it can be found in the wild in the first game is at the con camp, but it can be found in several places in Fallout 2. Although, again, it's not as easily found as the more powerful frag grenade, so there really isn't a great reason to use molotovs. Although the destructive potential of a molotov is not in its explosive power, but its ability to burn and catch other things on fire, in-game it deals explosive damage, and like all explosives in the first Fallout and Fallout 2, it can be used to destroy and get past some locked doors. Similarly, in Fallout Tactics, it is again an early game weapon that gets outclassed fairly quickly, but it is more accessible in the early game. It is mostly seen being used in the Macomb mission, where part of a convoy has to be safely guided through a hostile town and are primarily used by civilians. A number of civilians who are hungry and desperate will throw molotovs at the vehicles, and I find that funny because the vehicles are carrying supplies and the civilians want those supplies so they're trying to light them on fire. Okay. Despite not appearing in Fallout 3, it was absolutely meant to, but did not end up making it for some reason. Molotovs are mentioned by NPCs like Sierra Petrovita and is referenced several times in game files, but the in-engine references don't exist or are broken. It would have been easily recognizable as a Molotov, likely would have been a weaker alternative to frag grenades, but it would have differentiated itself from the other throwing weapons by having a throwing animation that would involve using a lighter to light the Molotov prior to throwing. The lighter and the lighting animation would be used in Fallout New Vegas for its own version of the Molotov, as well as things like dynamite. But I do want to say that I think it's a shame that it didn't make it in Fallout 3, as it would have made a great schematic weapon especially if you could craft it with different liquids for different effects. In New Vegas, what is called the Firebomb is a Molotov in form and function, being a sunset sarsaparilla bottle with a rag tied to the top, and it is lit with a butane lighter, sporting an image of a pinup girl with angel wings and a halo, which is just a great touch. It was introduced in the Honest Hearts add-on and is not as powerful as the common frag grenades or thrown dynamite. For some unknown reason, getting a critical hit with one will make the enemy gooify, exactly like what plasma weapons do on a critical hit. I do wonder why the developers opted to call it a firebomb rather than a Molotov cocktail, especially considering that nearly every game prior called them as such. There are some interesting quirks about this weapon though, like the in-game model has different dimensions from a normal bottle of Sunset Sarsaparilla, even though they supposedly are the same bottle. The size isn't even close. The firebomb is way smaller, and this was done in order to make the firebomb fit the throwing animations for other explosives. So I get it, but I still think it's pretty funny to look at them side by side. Another great thing is just like with the other explosives, you can reverse pickpocket these into enemies' inventories. After a little bit of time, the person will erupt into flames. How exactly? Shh, don't ask questions. These things can be tricky to use effectively because they will bounce before breaking, for some reason. 
The Molotov's final form comes in Fallout 4, where it is now a vodka bottle, and thrown explosives are no longer treated as a primary weapon, rather a secondary weapon that can be thrown while a primary weapon is equipped. Again, the Molotov is one of the weakest thrown explosives, but don't let that fool you, because these things are the number one killer of low-level survival playthroughs. I'm pretty sure I killed myself more with these than the enemy did. These are used heavily by super mutants and raiders, while higher level enemies will opt for harder hitting explosives like grenades. We know what goes into the molotovs since they are now craftable. They take adhesive, glass, cloth, and oil. I'm not sure if the adhesive is used in the construction of the molotov or as an ingredient for the flammable liquid inside. I could see it go either way. An interesting difference between Fallout 4 and the other games in regards to the Molotov and the other fire-based weapons is that there's no dedicated fire type of damage. Rather, it is considered collectively as energy damage along with electric, cryo, etc. In Fallout 76, the Molotov looks just like in Fallout 4, once again as the weakest of the thrown explosives. It can be crafted with the same recipe as in Fallout 4, but fire damage is once again its own type of damage in Fallout 76, giving it a bit more depth to the weapons since fire damage ignores energy resistance. Molotovs were also meant to be usable in the cancelled Fallout Extreme, as well as the unreleased Van Buren, which was supposed to be Fallout 3. Van Buren would have had a normal Molotov, as well as a so-called high-grade Molotov, that would have been used by a character named Bombay Jack and I'm guessing would have been more powerful due to a more flammable cocktail concoction. How about some bizarre bug-related explosives, eh? Fallout Tactics gives us one of the most unique explosives in the series, with the so-called Boom Bug. Boom Bugs are mutated ladybugs that have evolved to be much bigger and have a tendency to explode. I love the in-game description that says that the ladybugs have unstable chemistry that causes them to explode when agitated, disturbed, angry, or bored. <laughs> One of those things is not like the other. I mean, seriously, I can get agitated, disturbed, or angry, but bored? Like they just worked through their game backlog and didn't have anything else to do and just decided, well, this is the end. The Boom Bug does more damage than the Molotov, although not as much as a frag grenade, and can even deal some poison damage. They are found used primarily by Beast Lords, which makes sense because they are a raider group that uses animals in a lot of their fighting, but also all over the dead bodies of tribals in Peoria. I would just like to know how to keep a mutated ladybug from getting agitated, disturbed, angry, or bored while just chilling in your pocket until you're ready to throw it. Fallout 76 has its own bug grenade that is sadly not an actual bug like the boom bug, but just a boring old grenade design with some bugs painted on the side. It is kind of interesting though because it is one of the only grenades to detonate on impact rather than bouncing around for a bit, and also does increased damage to insects, while also dealing some poison damage. It is non-craftable, and it is only available to the player after finishing the Stings and Things daily quest. I feel like not naming it a bug bomb is kind of a missed opportunity, although it doesn't look or work like the bug bombs that we're used to. Mire lurks are kind of like bugs, right? I mean, at least some of them seem to be arthropods. Fallout 3 had a cut explosive known as the Mire Lurk Bait Grenade that was intended for use during the Wasteland Survival Guide quest that is given by Moira. Part of the quest requires the player to go and place an observation device in the Mire Lurk nesting area and it seems that the bait grenade was meant to be part of this quest. In order to get the best ending for the quest, one must not kill any Mire Lurks. So it seems contradictory for Moira to give the player the so-called bait grenades. However, the grenade, which can only be spawned into the game with console commands, explodes without dealing any damage. However, they still do have a shockwave that will send things flying. So, I see two likely scenarios. One is that the grenade was not meant to explode, but tossing one in a direction would make any hostile Mire Lurks forget about you and go chase the grenade, allowing you to slip by. Alternatively, maybe the grenades were meant to attract Mire Lurks, so you would throw them into a corner somewhere, and they would then get concussed and stunned by the grenade when it went off. 
buying the player some time to try and get by without actually killing them. It isn't all that clear just because we don't know if the grenade in game is the actual finished project, but let me know how you think this would have worked in the comments. One of the holiest entries on this entire list is very rare as it is only obtainable through a special encounter in Fallout 2, and made even more rare by the fact that in the base Fallout 2 game, the special encounter is completely bugged so you never see it. The Holy Hand Grenade is a very powerful grenade that also has a large range, and if you don't know the pop culture reference that inspired this, then your parents failed you as a child. Just kidding, but not really. The special encounter will drop the chosen one into a small map, where five power armor clad men are fighting a small rat. The men are named after King Arthur's knights, who surround the rat and are trying to kill it, and though oftentimes they will, sometimes the rat will be victorious. In a cave behind the battle is a chest that holds the holy hand grenade, which is a one-of-a-kind looking weapon. It is made to look like the Sovereign's Orb, which is one of the crown jewels of the British royal family. It is used during the coronation of a monarch, and meant to be held in the right hand and later placed on the altar during the ceremony. It is meant to reflect the Christian world, divided into three parts, which represented the three known continents that were recognized around the time it was created in the 1600s. The Holy Hand Grenade will do a whopping 3 to 500 base damage, and if the player uses the Holy Hand Grenade on the rat that is being fought outside the cave, they will be rewarded with 7,500 experience points, and that is not shabby. This weapon also has the Weapon Penetration perk, which makes it even more effective at bypassing armor. Although this special encounter is not possible to experience in the base Fallout 2 game due to scripting errors, it has been fixed in the Fallout 2 Restoration mod and is one of two Monty Python inspired special encounters. And just when you thought we were done with unusually sacred handheld explosives, Fallout New Vegas just had to show up. The Holy Frag grenade is only available to those that took the Wild Wasteland perk and is found in the basement of the church at Camp Searchlight, usually accompanied by some geckos. There are only three possible Holy Frag grenades that can be obtained, and they are located in a box with another upturned box that has the message Holy Hand Grenades, Pull Pin, and Count to Three. Previously, a five had been written there, but was crossed out and I find it interesting that the sign mentions Holy Hand Grenades when the game refers to them as Holy Frag Grenades. The model is not nearly as cool looking as in Fallout 2, being just a normal frag grenade, but it does have a white cross painted on the side, which, you know, that's not nothing. The Holy Frag Grenade does tremendous damage, with a base of 800, which is 200 more than a fat man. It also has a very large blast radius, larger than a mini nuke, which already kills the player more than anything else. If the courier has the loose cannon perk, which increases throw speed at the cost of throw distance, as well as the splash damage perk, which increases the blast radius for all explosives, the holy frag grenades will only ever be holy suicide grenades. The high damage and explosive effect just shreds armor, even those with high damage threshold and needs to be used very carefully, and preferably against white decapitating rabbits. Let's cool things off with a special kind of grenade that is only found in a few of the Fallout games. Fallout 3 received its Cryo Grenade, a handheld explosive device that has the ability to freeze enemies solid but it only appeared with the Mothership Zeta DLC. What is interesting though is that the Cryo Grenade was meant to be in the base game, and even had textures and a model in place, but it went unused. The Cryo Grenade that we get in the Mothership Zeta DLC actually looks quite different from what was intended to be in the base game. The original Cryo Grenade looks a lot closer to the concept art, and the design doesn't look as polished or high tech as the Cryo Grenade that we get in the DLC. Cryo grenades only deal one point of physical damage, and their main use is in their ability to freeze an enemy solid for three seconds. I feel like three seconds is not quite enough since you have to switch over to another weapon to actually kill your target, but it is a unique function, and it's hilarious to watch a target freeze and then fall over completely stiff. 
The cryo grenades can only be obtained after releasing Private Elliot Takorian from stasis while trying to escape the alien mothership. And this pre-war soldier had previous experience and training as a doctor and in the field of cryoscience. Clearing out the alien's cryo lab on board the ship with Elliot will cause him to start crafting cryo grenades, although it is not at a fast pace. And once the player and the rest of the team advance through the quest line far enough, he will leave the engineering core and cease to make any more grenades. You can get three from him the very first time, but only two every three hours after that. Cryo grenades can be reverse pickpocketed just like all other explosives and will freeze the target after a successful attempt. I prefer the grenade style that was meant to be in the base game and the design in the concept art even more since they look more like an unrefined, unconventional explosive. And that is exactly what they are meant to be. I also like to think about how exactly they work. Do they have some sort of pressurized gas or liquid that when released, rapidly expands and rapidly cools a target? Does it explode some super cooled substance onto the target? Or is it a special compound that undergoes an endothermic reaction that rather than heating things up like a conventional explosion, absorbs energy and cools things down. Fallout 4 is the next time we see a cryo grenade, although cryogenic is no longer shortened, so the game refers to them as cryogenic grenades. There is depressingly little we know about them. They look completely different from Fallout 3. They actually do damage to targets now and not just the one damage that they did in Fallout 3. Rather than completely freezing a target though, it will drastically slow them down for several seconds, slowing their attacks. Cryo grenades are not found in Vault 111, where a ton of cryo research was being performed, and the cryolator, a unique freezing weapon, can also be found. Rather, they're found in one location, which is the Public Works Maintenance Tunnel, and only accessible to the sole survivor when the nuclear option quest is active, which is where the player is meant to break into the Institute and blow it up. The area where the grenades are found are old CIT facilities that the Institute currently controls. So we are left to wonder if the cryo grenades are some forgotten Institute project or a remnant of pre-war research being conducted at CIT. It can be crafted though and the parts list is interesting. It requires adhesive, aluminum, a spring, acid, and nuclear material. I can't even begin to theorize how acid and nuclear material would freeze something, but if you do, I'm all ears. Fallout 76 has the same exact cryogenic grenades as Fallout 4, and likewise, they are not found in many places on the actual map, although they can be crafted with the same materials. Six can be found in an old truck that is just off the road, close by the National Radio Astronomy Research Center, but there are really no other contextual clues as to why these grenades are found here and only here. The effects are the same as in Fallout 4, slowing down targets rather than freezing them solid like in Fallout 3, but the freezing effects can also affect the player by removing all of the player's AP and preventing it from naturally restoring for 10 seconds. Since one freezing grenade apparently is not enough, Fallout 76 also has the so-called floater freezer grenade. It looks the same, and it has the same stats as the cryo grenades, but the crafting ingredients are different, requiring a freezing floater pus sack. Try to say that 10 times fast. Freezing floater pus sack, freezing floater. Oh, that's kind of hard. Freezing floaters are crazy creatures that I'm looking forward to covering in a future video. Suffice it to say that they can be found in three varieties in Appalachia, fire, ice, and acid. So using their body parts to create weapons with different effects does make some sense. <laughs> you hoped you wouldn't find yourself here, but alas, here you are learning about Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. While the game has a handful of explosives, an interesting one is the so-called homemade bomb, which is the weakest of the explosive options and thrown like a frag grenade. Really only useful in the early game, it looks suspiciously like a pipe bomb, and according to the in-game description, is apparently made from old wiring and cleaning materials. What the hell kind of cleaning materials are they using in this game? Another hastily crafted in-game explosive is found in Fallout New Vegas and is known as the Tin Grenade. It looks about what you would expect with a name like that, being comprised of a tin can, 
crammed with explosives that look like they are being held in place by two strips of tape. A small wire is bent into the shape of a grenade pin and gets pulled when arming the grenade before throwing. Although the crafting list for this item only mentions a tin can, pistol powder, and duct tape, there's also some sort of timer involved as well, which gives the courier time to throw the grenade before it detonates. Despite being easy to produce, it is effective at its purpose since it is not the lowest damaging of all thrown explosives, but if you have never seen or heard of this weapon, it's most likely because it is actually locked behind a perk. The player must select the Mad Bomber perk that will unlock a number of craftable explosives, of which this is one, and is otherwise unobtainable without console commands. Because of how simple the crafting is for this item, it is super easy to construct, even in resource scarce places like the Sierra Madre, and in fact can be a real boon to the player in the first part of the DLC when all their weapons have been stripped away. I wouldn't trust that thing as far as I could throw it. Wait, thirsty? Well, why don't you sit down and help yourself to a Nuka Cola Quantum? Oh, you're not thirsty. Oh, you're bloodthirsty. Well then, perfect because that quantum you have there can be turned into a handheld weapon of mass destruction. Fallout 3 is the first time we get the opportunity to see and use the Nuka Grenade, and it's one of the few craftable weapons in the entire game. Although schematics are needed to create Nuka Grenades, a few can be found in the wild, one at the Mechanist's workbench, several in the Citadel Armory, but those are only accessible if you destroy the Citadel at the end of the Broken Steel add-on, and lastly a few can be found in the Zayton Mothership. The explosion is very impressive dealing heavy damage at around 500 base and leaving lingering radiation that can be as high as 50 rads per second. This is roughly a third of the base damage of a fat man, but it's pretty damn good for some Nuka Cola Quantum mixed around in an old can. The explosion is unique as it has an initial blue shockwave that is followed by a yellow fireball. The crafting requirements are a Nuka Cola Quantum, a tin can, a Braxo cleaner, and turpentine. And this crazy concoction of cleaning materials, this again, and the radioactive Nuka Cola Quantum makes for a pretty blue and yellow explosion. Having the Quantum Chemist perk allows the Lone Wanderer to convert 10 normal Nuka Colas, of which there are functionally a limitless amount of, into one Quantum. So even though there are limited numbers of Quantum in the Capital Wasteland, one could theoretically always have a way to build more Nuka Grenades. It is shown as a fairly simple looking tin can, wrapped in tape with some wires poking out of it, and the same wire pin that we saw on the tin grenade. In fact, the two weapons bear a lot of resemblance to each other, but someone was kind enough to label the Nuka Grenade as dangerous and radioactive, because even in post-war America, getting sued is a reality. The most interesting thing about this weapon, however, is that it was originally meant to be a slightly altered version of the cut Fallout 3 Molotov cocktail. It would have been a Nuka Cola quantum bottle filled with the blue quantum drink and a simple cloth tied to the top that would have been lit prior to throwing. It is unknown why, but a decision was made to cut the Molotov cocktail and that change also apparently necessitated the Nuka grenade or Nuka cocktail as it would have been called to change its appearance as well. Fallout New Vegas uses the same Nuka Grenade model and even the same crafting requirements as Fallout 3, except for one single change. Rather than using Nuka Cola Quantum, the New Vegas version calls for Nuka Cola Quartz, really limiting the number of these that can be crafted. Nuka Grenades, just like the Tin Grenade, are locked out of normal use unless the Mad Bomber perk is chosen and the Nuka Grenade, while doing less damage than in Fallout 3, is the most powerful of all handheld explosives in the whole game. The only thing more powerful is the Holy Frag Grenade, which is only available with the Wild Wasteland perk. Although the Nuka Chemist perk can help the Courier convert Nuka Colas into Quartz, it is still a pretty scarce weapon to craft, and is otherwise ported directly from Fallout 3. Like many things in Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, Nuka Grenades got a major facelift. In fact, they are just completely unrecognizable. Rather than being some homemade 5th grade arts and crafts project, it is a precision made device that looks futuristic and professionally made. 
This is probably not too far off though, because it is actually not able to be crafted by the player anymore. It is not a very common weapon, and is extremely powerful, doing 300 damage and 100 rad damage, which when combined is almost as much as a fat man. One can be found in the castle armory, but most nuka grenades out in the wild are wielded by the holy children of Adam, and some can also be bought at merchants in the nucleus. Unfortunately, there isn't much else to say about this weapon, other than it's completely absurd to decide to create a small nuclear bomb that is meant to be thrown by hand. I do find it kind of funny though that the symbol on the side of the grenade is not the normal nuclear trifoil symbol. Rather, it is the symbol used to denote a nuclear shelter. Is it just a mistake, or was it put there as a show of irony? The nuclear grenades show up in the same form in Fallout 76, but this one is craftable, and the items required to make it are kind of weird. It takes aluminum, likely for the metal shell, a fragmentation grenade, maybe to initiate the super criticality needed for an uncontrolled nuclear reaction, and just a plain Jane Nuka Cola. Why have we been mixing the much rarer Nuka Cola Quantum with a bunch of random chemicals when all we needed to do was strap a frag grenade to a Nuka Cola? <sighs> Nuka grenades do a bit less damage than in Fallout 4 and are also sold by Leo Petrov, who was a ghoul that was a pre war Nuka Cola employee. The Nuka World DLC for Fallout 4 gave us another variation of the Nuka Grenade, and that is the Nuka Quantum Grenade. It looks similar to the Nuka Grenade, but the bottom half is mostly glass, where you can see the glowing blue quantum liquid inside. Nuka Quantum Grenades are actually the result of a secret joint project between the Nuka Cola Corporations and the US military known as Project Cobalt. It focused on the development of strontium-90 based weapons, which is the key ingredient in quantum. This grenade is one of the results, along with other weapons like the Nuka Nuke, which is a strontium infused version of a mini nuke. What is interesting is that the quantum grenades do a little bit less damage than the standard Nuka grenade, and they deal no radiation damage. I find it interesting that the quantum grenade has no radiation, considering it seems to be a small nuclear explosion complete with a mushroom cloud. What kind of reaction is happening that appears to be a small nuclear explosion is occurring with a liquid that has a ton of radioactive isotopes and is somehow not dealing radiation damage. The explosion itself is a little underwhelming. It does have a nice blue mushroom cloud, but there is no large impressive fireball that is even close to the actual Nuka grenade. The only quantum grenades that can be found in the wild are in the experimental facility under the world of refreshment where a lot of the Project Cobalt research was being done. Otherwise, they will need to be crafted and require all the components needed for a Nuka grenade, except the nuclear material is traded out for Nuka Cola Quantum. To be honest, there doesn't seem to be a great reason to opt for the Nuka Quantum Grenade over the normal Nuka Grenade since nuclear material is relatively easy to come across if you are regularly collecting junk and scrapping. Fallout 76 has the same model and even the same damage for the Nuka Quantum Grenades, and the requirements to craft them are similar to the Nuka Grenades, where they just require aluminum, a frag grenade, and a Nuka Cola Quantum. For those that don't have plans to build one, some grenades can be bought from Flintlock, the Mr. Handy at the White Springs Resort. The Nuka Cherry Grenade is a cut grenade type that was meant to be available with the Nuka World DLC. The model differs a bit in that the lower portion of the grenade is a cola brown color, rather than the quantum blue, which, you know, that makes sense. They also have a unique but very underwhelming explosion. It is red, which seems appropriate for a cherry cola derived explosive, but that explosion is just tiny. Seriously, just look at how small that is. The blast radius is similarly small, and my best guess is that these things would have been changed if the Nuka Cherry Grenade actually made it into the game. The only way to get them in game is through console commands, but they are capable of pretty solid damage at around 200. The files for the weapon were carried over into Fallout 76, but as of the present day, they have not actually been implemented, although it is possible we could eventually see it. Perhaps the presence of the Quantum Grenade makes the slightly less powerful Cherry Grenade redundant, and that's why we haven't seen it in game. So we've had Freezing Grenades, Bug Grenades, Holy Grenades, and Sugary Beverage Grenades. 
so it seems only appropriate that we take a look at the acidic and toxic grenades that we find in the series. In Fallout Tactics, there is an acid grenade, and there are only eight that can be found in the whole game. They are rare, not because of the amount of damage they do, they do around the same damage as the average frag grenade, but because the acid damage will bypass armor. This makes them very useful against heavily armored enemies like super mutants and even robots. The grenade looks similar to the Mark III family of grenades which was first designed in 1918. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel has its own toxic grenade, which has lower damage than any other explosive, but makes up for it by drenching enemies in a toxic substance that will eventually deplete health over a 10 second interval. The design is… interesting. I have a hard time figuring out exactly how this would work. It seems like a stick grenade with the toxic explosive charge at the end in a large metal sphere. It honestly looks more like a melee weapon than a grenade, but that's on par for Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. They are fairly common and can be found in several places and are dropped by the kamikaze ghouls that are encountered in Los. The Floater Nasher Grenade from Fallout 76 works very similarly to the Toxic Grenade in Brotherhood of Steel. It sacrifices initial explosion damage for 8 seconds worth of acid damage on any targets close to the point of detonation. The in-game representation is a hallucinogen canister that we first saw in Fallout 4 with small clear windows that let us see the caustic green substance in the middle. The Nasher grenade is made just like the floater freezer, just using a little Nasher pus sack instead of a freezer one. The plan to build the grenades can be bought from a Mr. Handy merchant named Mortimer at the raider controlled crater settlement. There are many things you can make a grenade out of that may not be optimal, but if it's the post apocalypse and you just need to blow something up, one can be forgiven for filling a tin can with some gunpowder and calling it a day. What I refuse to believe would ever make a decent impromptu grenade is a baseball. The primary source of these seems to be Mo Cornyn at Diamond City, the baseball obsessed merchant that is constantly trying to sell you a swatta. He will always have some in his inventory and a few kicking around his house in Diamond City, and otherwise they can be found in many other places around the commonwealth. It can be even found in some pre-war DIA caches that are uncovered as a radiant quest for the railroad. That would seem to imply that baseball grenades are a pre-war weapon? Was this some sort of spy weapon? Something that would be carried out without arousing suspicion? Like some sort of American version of 007? They are not as powerful as a frag grenade, but they do have one advantage over any other grenade type. They will not alert enemies until they detonate. All other grenade types will alert enemies when it bounces off the ground before detonation, but apparently the baseball grenade is soft enough to not be detected. That could also be why the explosion is not as damaging. It can be crafted and requires adhesive, a baseball, steel, fertilizer, and oil. And you know, those items actually make sense. Nitrogen fertilizer has been recognized as a dangerous explosive, so this could work. In Fallout 76, the baseball grenade actually becomes more powerful than the frag grenade for whatever reason and has the same crafting requirements except no longer requiring a baseball and just asking for cork instead, even though baseballs can be found as junk items in the game. Smoke grenades are very common in warfare, as concealing an area and denying the enemy the chance to see and respond to what is happening can be very advantageous. It is interesting then that the smoke grenades have never actually been implemented in a Fallout game, and that is not for a lack of trying. The first smoke grenade was meant to feature in the cancelled Fallout Extreme game and was also supposed to feature in Fallout Tactics, but that was cut. It uses a slightly altered version of the acid grenade and the affected area would have cut the perception of anyone affected by several points, which is very cool. Fallout 3's Operation Anchorage DLC was meant to also feature smoke grenades, but they were cut yet again and are not available to the player without some creativity. The smoke grenades look just like normal frag grenades and also explode just like frag grenades. They don't emit smoke and they do way more damage than they probably should. And I'm sure that's because they never implemented the actual mechanics they were wanting in game. You can use console commands to spawn them in or 
you can climb up some rocks and jump past the invisible walls meant to keep the player within the map at the final stage of the DLC. They were just west of the field HQ and look and are used just like normal frag grenades. Another improvised grenade is one that I am surprised we haven't really seen before until Fallout New Vegas. And even then, it wasn't added until the Gunrunners add-on was released. And even then, it can't be used unless you have the Mad Bomber perk. The Microfusion Cell Grenade is a microfusion cell with a small red LED poking out of the top with a black band around the middle. There is no clue how this could work since the MFC grenade, as I'm going to call it, is crafted only using three microfusion cells and no other objects. That makes this grenade the easiest to craft, but doesn't really answer any questions as to why the grenade looks the way it does. When it detonates, it has an area of effect similar to a plasma grenade, and interestingly, the explosion is identical as well, although it is significantly weaker, dealing one-third the base damage of a plasma grenade. It will even give off green light on the first bounce, just like a plasma grenade. We get zero hints as to how this works, since the throwing animation shows the player pulling a non-existent pin before throwing, and so we can only speculate. If I were to guess, the black band around the middle is some sort of explosive that cracks open the microfusion cell, either just releasing whatever the energy is inside the cell, or kickstarting an explosive reaction of the fusion cell contents. I would love to hear your ideas and thoughts on this though, and wonder if we can use this as a clue when we consider how exactly microfusion cells work. So since we just mentioned the plasma grenade, let's look at that last. Plasma grenades are one of the few explosives that can be found in every single Fallout game, and then some. Plasma has just always been an important part of Fallout's weapon landscape. In the very first Fallout, plasma grenades are much more powerful and rare than nearly any other thrown explosive, and therefore it is really only encountered in high level areas and on the bodies of super mutants. Let me blow your mind right now by being the first to tell you that plasma grenades deal plasma damage, as opposed to explosive or any other damage type, and that makes them highly effective against all targets. The plasma grenade itself looks similar to the previously mentioned Mark III series of grenades with parallel ridges along the sides. The explosion is unique to this weapon as well, since the explosion has a green tint to it, matching the other plasma weaponry. The weapon description gives us interesting information, namely that it is magnetically sealed with some detonating explosives that create a blast of superheated plasma on contact. So the way that it makes the most sense to me is that the detonating explosives creates the plasma from whatever gas or material is inside the grenade, which is itself magnetically confined until the building pressure exceeds the magnetic confinement and explodes outwards. This is the same operating principle behind just a normal grenade, where the metal walls of the grenade let the pressure spike to body-rending levels before failing and releasing the explosion. Only this time, the detonating explosives are also key in generating the plasma, which is what is doing most of the damage rather than pure concussive force or fragmentation. Plasma grenades appear and function exactly the same in Fallout 2, although there are more static places where they can be found and are often found used by the Enclave soldiers or Habologists. One important difference though is that advanced power armor has a resistance to plasma weapons, where it can reduce 50 to 80% of plasma damage. I do find it interesting that the Enclave specifically built this resistance into their power armor when plasma grenades are altogether quite rare and they are one of the only primary groups that uses them. Fallout Tactics has plasma grenades as well with a very faithful representation, even having the same damage as Fallout 2. Although they are the most powerful of all grenades in the game, pulse grenades are more useful against robots, which are the primary enemy at the end of the game, so hoarding them may not make the most sense if you have a specialized grenadier on the team. One interesting difference though is that they will leave behind a little bit of radiation after exploding, hinting towards the use of radioactive materials. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel, the uncontroversial high point of the Fallout series, has its own plasma grenades too. This is the first time that we see a design change 
and it is the second best thrown explosive in the whole game, dealing explosive and electrical damage. Targets that are within the blast radius will be electrocuted for about 5 seconds, which is an interesting effect. Plasmas are great electrical conductors, but it would seem to imply that the grenade itself also generates a good amount of electricity. Maybe that is why the weapon looks a little different. Plasma grenades in the game are only sold or found in the secret vault, either from the shop tech terminals or the vendor Ching Tsun. Fallout 3 is the next time we see the plasma grenade and once again, it gets a makeover. It is the second most powerful grenade, being better than everything else, but significantly weaker than the nuker grenade. But to be fair, it is also a lot less likely to blow you or your companion to kingdom come. The blast is green like all previous games, and while it is the best of the grenades that you can regularly come across, it's not exactly rare. It only deals explosive damage in Fallout 3, and the design is interesting. It has three protruding green glowing nubs on either end of the grenade, and has a cool effect when it's primed and ready to be thrown. The player uses the same pin-pull animation, although again there's no pin, and the top and bottom of the grenades slide out a bit to reveal the glowing green contents. I think that's a very nice touch, and perhaps pushing the top or bottom of the grenade to extend the ends is how the device is armed. The design is similar to one of the plasma grenade concepts, with a notable exception being that the concepts give off a purple light. There is another cool concept that shows the plasma grenade as a stick kind of grenade that has a toggle switch instead of any sort of pin, and I kind of love this design. Also, I will die on this hill, I love the purple color that was used on all the plasma concept art for Fallout 3. Fallout New Vegas used the same model as Fallout 3, although since it is a very potent weapon, it requires a relatively high explosive skill to use adequately. They are much more powerful than frag grenades, and therefore only found in a handful of places like Nellis Air Force Base or the Silver Rush to name a few. Fallout 4 once again redesigns the plasma grenade, although it isn't as radical as a jump from the early games to Fallout 3. It has the green nubs only on the bottom of the grenade now, and is overall a bit smaller, but unfortunately we no longer get the cool arming animation. The grenade looks exactly the same both unarmed and armed. It deals 150 base damage like a frag grenade, but an additional 150 energy damage on top of that. These can also be crafted with a parts list suspiciously similar to the cryogenic grenades that you can also craft. Although it requires a little more of each item, the only difference is that it swaps the acid needed for the cryo grenade for circuitry, so it seems that there are some critical electronics required for the plasma generation, although we can probably assume the basic working principles haven't changed since the first fallouts. Shockingly, there is only one static location for plasma grenades in the whole game, which is in the tunnels that the player works their way through during the big dig quest in Good Neighbor. However, they are also used by high level enemies like gunners and can be looted off their bodies, and also bought at many merchants who sell weapons. Fallout 76 has the same model as in Fallout 4, but the grenade gets a damage boost to both the ballistic damage and energy damage components. The crafting is also similar, but now it requires a plasma cartridge, and that honestly makes sense to me, and is a bit surprising that one wasn't required in Fallout 4. Again, they're not super common in Appalachia, but the storage room at Camp Venture is a guaranteed location to loot some, if you don't feel like or you can't craft any. Now it is also worth noting that the plasma grenade was meant to be in the cancelled Fallout Extreme, and was also supposed to be in Van Buren. There is a model in the game files, and it looks way different from basically anything else. We can't be sure that this would have been the final design, but that thing just looks like a thermos to me. I mean, come on, look at it. Actually, I should make a thermos that looks like that. That is it, my rad fellows. Although there is plenty more to cover, since there are more grenades, as well as a ton of mines that deserve our attention. Thank you to my mostly beautiful patrons who try and curry favor by donating on Patreon. And you know, I think it's working. Special shout out to Nick Yoder, Bob Dingleberry, and Mike from Texas. I'm definitely putting in the good word for you with the big man upstairs. 
Embrace the glow. Please take care of yourselves. Adam needs you. And I will see you next week.